there and welcome to the Secrets of Organ Playing podcast. I'm your host, Vidas Pinkavichus. Welcome to Secrets of Organ Playing podcast number 90. This is Sunday, April 16, 2017. Uh, blessed Easter to everyone, to my listeners, and I'm very happy to announce this next podcast conversation and the guest today is uh, Peter Vantour whom you might probably know from our previous interview on his research uh, from the late 18th century Naples School of Composition and Counterpoint and Partimenti. So Peter is um, a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Leuven, Belgium, and as a scholar in musicology, uh, Peter has specialized in the counterpoint pedagogy and historic improvisation and composition. He studied music pedagogy for five years at Brabant Conservatory in Tilburg, master in musicology at the University of Utrecht, and master of music theory at the Royal College of Music in Stockholm. Peter's PhD dissertation, Counterpoint and Partimento, uh, Methods on Teaching Composition in the Late 18th Century Naples, highlights uh, the practical teaching strategies at the Neapolitan Conservatories during the late 18th century. And uh, our podcast number 69 features this uh, research we did previously with Peter. In 1995, Peter co-founded the Gotland School of Music Composition, where he has been teaching music theory until uh, 2014. So in this conversation, Peter shares his insights about his new publication on 189 Partimenti of Nicolo Sala, who was an important composer, pedagogue and music uh, theorist from the late 18th century Naples, Italy. Let's go to the show. So, Peter, you are a wonderful person, wonderful researcher. Uh, we've been connecting with each other, uh, following each other's research and writing uh, for, uh, for a number of months now. And I've talked to you about your previous uh, research about the late uh, Baroque um, uh, Naples uh, school, uh, uh, playing accompaniments, partimenti. And um, this, this is the second time we've been connected i'm so delighted you agreed to have this conversation because you have just uh, published the new book called the uh, 189 partimenti of nicolas sala with the critical uh, edition and uh, commentary too thank you so much and welcome to the show thank you Excellent. Yes, I can, I can tell you a little bit about the, the edition. It, uh, it will be available uh, from uh, Uppsala University uh, Press uh, from the 15th of, uh, of uh, April. And uh, it is the first critical edition of uh, a Partimento Maestro. There have been a lot of interest in Partimento research the last uh, 10, 15 years. And, uh, um, we have been mapping the entire repertoire in archives and libraries um, yeah, the, for the last uh, five, six years. And now the time starts to come that, uh, that we can actually um, um, yeah, put things together in a, in a more concise way. And uh, Nicolas Sala is a very interesting uh, composer because he is, he is called one of the foremost counterpointists of his day um, and um, he, he was a, a teacher at one of the Neapolitan conservatories for more than 50 years so he was a long time teacher with an incredible experience in, in teaching uh, young students from all over Europe actually um, and uh, he, his partimenti are stand out within the repertoire for being perhaps more contrapuntal than any other maestro. So I have been very fascinated by his uh, stuff. And uh, yeah, this will be the, uh, the first critical edition uh, of, of a Partimento Maestro. Mm -hmm. So Peter, uh, can you tell us uh, what is a Partimento and how it is uh, 
related to what uh, organists and keyboardists did in 18th century or even earlier? Yes, I, um, well, the definition of what a partimento is actually, um, I have proposed a slightly different definition uh, than um, previous scholars have done. And the reason for that is that I discovered in my research that partimenti actually appear in counterpoint notebooks. And that is not something that has, has not been known before. So if we look at counterpoint exercises, so the written stuff that, that uh, students did at these schools, there we can actually find uh, the partimenti in the baselines, a little bit like, uh, like you can find uh, all the church hymns in, in the baselines of Fuchs' uh, um, Gradus at Parnassum. So you, you have something to work from. And um, um, so in my definition of a partimento, I say that it is a, a notational device uh, for uh, learning to play and to improvise, but also to write, actually. So the partimento has a double function. It is both used to learn to play. Uh, so there could, could be a bass line in, in f clef with Thorobos figures, and you learn to, yeah, you learn to realize that on the organ or, or on the harpsichord. But it is also used for, um, yeah, they put it in the baseline of a, of a counterpoint exercise, and they actually write their exercises above these uh, bass lines. So it is, it is a double function, and it looks very much as if, as if the, the practical exercises on the keyboard were used as a preparation a practical preparation before you started to write, which is a very good idea. And this, this is something that, uh, that, yeah, that has been discovered and it, it changes slightly our, our understanding of, of how partimenti actually were used within the curriculum of, of these Neapolitan uh, conservatories. Mm -hmm. So basically, I, yeah. partimenti is a device where you could write the baseline of the piece, right? And in, yeah. in uh, addition to the baseline, you write the uh, figures of intervals, right? Uh, That's numbers. Right. Yeah. Of yeah. The base. And the, the player should realize the baseline together with the numbers, make it in, into a sound, sounding composition, yeah. basically. Uh, maybe yeah. a variation or accompaniment to the singers or, or even a self-standing uh, piece. That's right. If if we could take, uh, I'm I'm here sitting at my uh, piano, and I could actually show you uh, a little um, uh, example of uh, how this works. If you take uh, a very common uh, uh, harmonic schema uh, from this uh, time in history, we could have a, a chromatic bass line. Uh, a, a chromatic falling bass line, which is often used for lamento uh, pieces in, in all kinds of, uh, of organ music or, or uh, cantatas or whatever. Uh, that could uh, sound like this. Yes, chromatic uh, tetrachord. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this and if we, if we would have this in the partimento, then maybe there would be uh, thoroughbass figures above this line, which would show uh, a second line, which we could play like this. Well, this is something you, you almost recognize from the music. It is a very common uh, figure. And uh, the, the figures often only show the most important lines, so maybe we should uh, add something more to that. And uh, the organist uh, then is invited to, to, um, to add uh, such notes that it, it becomes chords, and then it might sound like this. Yes. 
And the whole thing with partimenti now is, and partimento pedagogy, is all about starting to make variations of these uh, things. So even if you have one line and it, it only has one figuring, there are many different ways to do this. And the fluency and the flexibility for the player to, to, to do things in a lot of different ways is actually the valuable uh, thing of, of this pedagogy. So this little st thing that I just played could be varied by uh, switching the alto and the soprano part, and then it would sound like... Right? And uh, even this could be varied and changed even further, and you, you could do something like... So, so this is a this is With the help of the invertible counterpoint. You can switch the melodies around, yeah, and, uh, and figures to yeah. enliven the texture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you do this with young students almost every day, and they learn to become flexible and and change things in a number of various ways, then you. You, you will equip these uh, students with a, a fluency of thinking and a fluency of playing so that they, they can actually become very fast in, in opera production, for example. Well, everything was about productivity in, in, the, in the late 18th century. If you would be successful as an opera composer, you needed to be able to write a few operas each year. And uh, to, to, uh, to encourage this... Uh, uh, this this fluency in the partimento pedagogy was uh, was very very fruitful. Mm -hmm. Yes, and for I... first the day, of course, this is valuable because we are in a, at a situation where the old uh, um, 19th century German harmony and uh, the the sometimes very dry pedagogy of learning all the rules of Fuchs and uh, yeah these these thick books of counterpoint, they are getting increasingly difficult for young students who have been taught through YouTube and, uh, and a lot of new techniques which have come. So that is, I think, the explanation why Partimenti have become so, so um, important today because it, it gives an alternative of learning more through, through hearing and, uh, and uh, through playing by ear so it is really a way of of uh, integrating oral training into uh, the learning of uh, theory and uh, and playing at the same time am i right peter saying that uh, partimenti were created before the rules of harmony were uh, founded before the textbooks of harmony were written Right, it was the, the the more practical approach. Harmony is is dry, perhaps, and very methodical and systematic. And very good if you are a scholar and uh, you know you want to to teach somebody um, how to make voice leading. Uh, but it takes uh, many years, and uh, yeah. with partiment is very practical. You you can add intervals above the bass, and you can create beautiful accompaniments and even pieces creations within minutes. Yeah. Well, the, the, there are, of course, rules here too, but the, the, the difference is that uh, the rules come after the practical training. So you, you start playing and you start learning the language, and after that you learn the grammatics of the language and not the other way around. So it is yes. a more natural way of, of, of learning. But if you look at the Partimento uh, manuscripts uh, in, in Italian archives, you can find uh, sometimes uh, entire primers with a lot of Partimento rules too. So there are rules, of course, also, but, but they, are not, uh, they are not used in an elementary way that, that, that you have to learn a lot of rules before you can start to play. It's rather the other way around. You start to play and then... You see, what did I actually do? 
You know, I have an idea, Peter, a theory. In those days, uh, where Parlimenti were first created, in the Baroque period, in the classical period, right? Yeah. Um, people were mainly practical musicians, right? They made music. And yeah. they had to figure out the method of uh, transmitting this skill as fast as possible, as, as easy manner as possible. Today, yeah. most of the students are uh, being raised to be what uh, players, but they don't they don't uh, uh, play from uh, from uh, uh, from imagination, right? They play written down music, and the yeah. only purpose of harmony and theory today, as is this taught in most schools, is uh, basically to analyze written down pieces. So, yes. if if for example one would would uh, uh, analyze Bach's um, chorale, chorale uh, harmonizations from his cantatas, 371, right? Today we would teach those students to know the vertical chords, what, uh, what are, um, uh, what, what, what's happening vertically and what each function of the chord is, right? But yeah. it doesn't um, help the students so much to make their own harmonization uh, in an easy manner. Whereas uh, with figure bass and partimento, uh, they, they, in, in those days they could produce music uh, multiple times each day. Exactly. That's my point. Because yeah. it's dry and uh, theoretical, no longer, no longer practical approach today. Yeah. And, the, and it's good even if, if people analyze a lot of music. I, I, I congratulate that. But in a lot of schools, they only write harmonic exercises, you know, harmonization of the melody or the bass, and that's it, which is um, completely unmusical, not musical at all. Uh, it's not connected with real-life examples. So it's, it's, what it's interesting, that, interesting that you mentioned this uh, about the, the choral harmonization, because there are similar things we can see in the German um, Baroque too. Uh, the last uh, decade there have been uh, several chorale books for organists in which we have found multiple bosses. So you, you find a, a pedagogy there uh, around Leipzig and Halle and Dresden in which uh, organists were taught from uh, uh, chorale melodies and they were encouraged to give not one harmonization, but maybe five or, or and to learn to be flex, become flexible in how to harmonize these tunes. So this is also a practice which is quite similar to the, to the partimento tradition. Right. The most famous probably example in real life uh, situation is um, the St. Matthew Passion, right, by Bach, where he has uh, the same chorale tune harmonized in many different ways uh, yeah. and in many different keys too. Um, yeah. It's symbolical, of course, but it, it really has different harmonizations yeah. uh, and different bass lines. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, wonderful. Uh, so, uh, so I see already today how it can help today's organist and keyboardist and uh, early music lovers, this partimento approach that uh, Nicola Sala uh, created. It was, was it a pedagogical um, um, volume that he written 189 for his own students? Or what did you find in his, your research, Peter? Uh, actually, the, the largest source of... Uh, so, the, the largest single source... Uh, of only Salas pieces is an autograph which is in Paris today in the Bibliothèque Nationale de France and uh, it comprises 131 pieces. So that is the largest source. But since there are several autographs by Sala, uh, I have included all, all pieces that I have, I have found which can be attributed to, to Sala. So uh, that's why I come up to 189. And uh, one thing that I also should men mention now when I, when I uh, uh, talk to organists is that uh, Nicola Sala is uh, the maestro in, in uh, Naples who wrote most partimento fugues. Mm -hmm. So if you would like to learn fugal improvisation, 
these pieces by Sala are extremely important because uh, he has no less than 60 partimento fugues. So it is almost a third of, of these two books that, are, uh, uh, that con- contain uh, partimento fugues. And uh, they are uh, yeah, very nice pieces to, uh, to learn to become fluent in how fugues are, are done. Of course, you, you only get the, the lowest sounding voice in these fugues. So you have to remember the theme, you have to remember the counter subject, and you must learn, you must learn how to, where, where you can place the counter subject. So there's a lot of uh, training uh, involved in before you can make a real fugue from only a, a theme, which was also done, but which is even more uh, uh, difficult. I remember seeing and practicing from the famous Langlotz manuscript. It yeah. was what uh, German sourced, right? Um, That's correct. Maybe, maybe the source, uh, which really reminds sometimes of books the Hood is writing. Uh, sometimes with uh, fast and quick um, thematic material, just yeah. as we see in, in some of the uh, organ uh, yeah. preludia, uh, fugal yeah. section, with uh, this um, stilus fantasticus um, uh, appearance. And in fact, uh, they can we could take the uh, entire preludium by Buxtehude and uh, notate it as partimento, right? And it's people true. have done yeah. it before, I've seen mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and it's possible. Yeah. And it simplifies so much. And that we could even think that uh, Master himself, like Buxtehude, and others like, like Sala, uh, yeah. could play, could play and notate very di- difficult compositions. But first, in their mind, it was a baseline with, yeah. with some figures. Right? Absolutely. So what you're saying, Peter, is very, very helpful. Thank you. And fugal improvisation is, uh, is, is, is a little bit advanced technique, right? Advanced, but it then is. you have this baseline, and, and um, above the baseline, not only you have figures, but you also have uh, those entrances, right? Uh, of tenor, alt, and, uh, and, uh, and the soprano. Just the entrances, and you have to yep. fill in the harmony, the voice leading also, a counterpoint to, uh, yep. as you say, you remember how it sounds at the, from the beginning. It's, yep. it's a little later stage, yep. but it's still possible. And there is one uh, musicologist, Br- Bruno Gingratz, he has called uh, the, this partimento fugue for the bridge, the bridge towards uh, fugal improvisation, and that's really what it is. So it is a step towards doing it without the notated bass line. Mm-hmm. So if you can do it from a bass line, you're, you're all, all, uh, already halfway, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And, and the next step would be to, to do it all by heart and just to do it from a, from a theme. And you have to rapidly think what kind of counter subject you could uh, imagine in which will work in double counterpoints so you can put it above and and under the subject and you have to uh, rapidly think uh, what kind of uh, transitions you could make from one key to another key and so on and this is uh, things that organists trained almost every day so the, at least the, the, the most, uh, the, most the, the best organists in the time of Bach, and Bach was certainly one of them, uh, they could do this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And isn't that strange, Peter, that uh, in the 20th century, beginning of the 20th century, um, when the French uh, parish conservatory dictated the, uh, you know, the cultural environment for, uh, for entire world, basically, yeah. uh, they had this great uh, uh, fugal writing uh, textbook by André Gedalj. Uh, yeah. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his last name correctly, but but could be Gedalj or Gedalj, uh, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. And yeah. in this book, it's, it's completely the opposite approach than Partimento. You first uh, uh, 
learn how to do an answer, then you add uh, um, this uh, counterpoint, right? You then uh, make uh, exposition, then counter exposition episodes, and then stratos uh, answers and questions in other keys, and, and put everything back together. Everything very dry and really complicated, scholastic cubes, right? Although, although it must be said that also Jadavis and uh, this tradition it is not so I think, uh, can you hear? Um, I think sound is lost. Okay. Uh, although I, I would say that uh, this uh, Jadal tr tradition is not so far away from the Partimento tradition as one might think, because uh, still in the 1860s and the 1870s, uh, French uh, theory was very much dominated by Partimento thinking. Uh, so although he, he fixes, fixes his theory in a book which is very accurate and, uh, uh, yeah, and thick, <laughs> but uh, his... Uh, he, there is still a, a fluency of thinking in, in this tradition in France. Mm -hmm. Actually, it is in France where this Partimento tradition survived um, um, the longest in Europe because of the, the Paris Conservatory was, was actually modeled from the Neapolitan conservatives. There, there were Neapolitans who founded the, the Paris Conservatory. So, the whole pedagogy of uh, Paris th uh, theory was very much Neapolitan. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that is still visible in, in this uh, fugal tradition of the, of, the late, uh, of the late 19th century. Good. Yeah. But, uh, and, uh, although this book is thick, you say it, it's based on the previous tradition, right? It's based yeah, I think so. yeah, yeah. On, the, on the Neapolitan uh, school of writing uh, um, uh, how uh, how uh, Partimento tradition uh, can be traced back to let's say Marburg you know this Abhandlung von der Fuge this um, this treatise about creating fugues uh, which I would suspect that Zedals also uh, used in his teaching yeah mm -hmm. yeah the I think the, the origins of the Partimento tradition lay perhaps in, in the late 17th century. So um, Pasquini is uh, often uh, uh, mentioned as one of the very first pedagogues, pedagogues who started to, to learn his students to sketch fugues. If you would become, you, you needed to become fast as a church musician and to sketch a fugue in a, in a quarter of an hour or something like that, then you could learn to use partimento notation to just to write down the lowest sounding voice of the fugue that you, that you improvised on the keyboard, and you make a, a very fast transcription of what you intend to do, and then you use figures to remember what you would do above the bass. So that is how it, how it started. Mm -hmm. And then it became a pedagogical tool for learning to play and learning to improvise and learning to, to make diminutions and, and everything. But it actually started, at least that's what I think, it started as a, as a tool to, to sketch um, uh, vocal music very fast uh, with partimento notation. Mm -hmm. What... Uh what are your experience with modern day students, Peter? Uh, do you meet real life students and uh, encourage and uh, um, try to give them examples of pertinent to study? Yeah, well, the most important thing I think is to, uh, at least for me, it is uh, a way of making music theory uh, more fun and more practical. Um, so that is the main, the main thing that I, that I get from this Partimento tradition. I, I am a little bit hesitant to, 
to uh, introduce a lot of uh, thoroughbars fig- figuring in in general music theory courses because students often think that they 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 feel that they already have so many systems to learn like chord symbols and uh, functional harmony and uh, and everything and and if if you come with yet another system then they get a little bit tired so i try to to uh, to downplay uh, this importance of the figures a little bit and and to just use the practical side of this uh, theory to to just uh, encourage students to 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 have fun with uh, with this kind of uh, harmonic schemas and to to play and to learn to vary make variations of uh, of of harmonic models but that's the most important thing for me mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah? yes still it's very practical although students as you say have uh, a lot of uh, material to learn, a lot of different systems, right? The harmony, yes. uh, counterpoint is still required in many yes. cases. And music theory, ba- ba- basics. Um, so, so then if you introduce partiment as a separate discipline, and um, then, then this becomes a little bit too much. But you can incorporate this system into, into probably a regular classroom, class, classroom yeah. teaching. Yeah, what I do is- I, I use it a lot in in classes of oral training. So if they still they still have to learn um, harmony by ear to to imitate to to play uh, to play things. Uh, if you have a uh, individual lessons with uh, conductors, uh, student conductors, for example, you can have two pianos with the backs against each other, and they only get the bass line and some some figures to help them in their orientation. And then I make these variations and I ask the students to, to just play after me. And so, so they become fluent by just imitating all kinds of harmonic stuff. And it's mm-hmm. often only three-part harmony and not four-part, which is also a very, it's a big advantage to, to learn to imitate in three parts because it, it gets much more transparent. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. In, in, uh, it's all manual and uh, um, not as a thick texture you don't have to play two voices in each hand mm, and you no. don't um, fluctuate between each hand uh, because exactly. like, or tenor yep. depending on the situation exactly mm-hmm. me too uh, uh, Peter uh, this year I started uh, you know, I have this uh, several classes I teach uh, for air training, and they are seventh and eighth graders. And sometimes we we play dictations for them, melodic dictations, and they write down melodies. Sometimes in one part, sometimes in two parts. Okay. And yeah. usually our textbooks are very dry and unmusical at all. Um, somebody you know, like a senior teacher, uh, came up with some eight or four bar phrases for them. Uh, you know, which which are systematized uh, according to the um, topics, keys, yep. perhaps meters, uh, uh, other materials that we we teach uh, during the cl- uh, year, and uh, this is our uh, way of teaching. But this year, I opened up 371 choral harmonizations by Bach, and. Um, started to playing ex- excerpts of them as a dictation, you know, not four parts, mm-hmm. but just soprano and bass, let's say, for two yeah. parts. Yeah. And it's, not only it's beautiful, but students like them so much that they ask to sing them, to sing, and to, I, I even add two missing parts, alto and tenor, while they sing uh, soprano and the bass. And it's like a small uh, chamber choir then at the end of the lesson. And, you know, it's, it's real touch with real music. So yeah. partimento is kind of the same thing. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's less advanced than harmonization, but it's so practical and so beautiful. I remember you, you uh, Peter, playing those variations on chromatic descending tetrachord. Yeah. It sounds like any Baroque composition... Uh, from any any 
traditional Baroque composer. Uh, yeah. Could be spelling, right? Could be Buxtehude, could be uh, even Bach sometimes, right? Mm, could be Bohm, could be could be later music too, Italian, as you say. Yes. Uh, so it's all very, very cosmopolitan musical language from the yeah, Baroque cool. style. Yeah. And still appeals to today's ears yeah. for kids. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. So I, uh, I wish Peter uh, very much uh, uh, a lot of uh, success and um, persistence in your uh, further research because I suspect that it's not uh, easy for you to analyze and to find out more about those uh, pertinenti. Uh, uh, did Sala publish this edition or was it in handwriting everything? It is all, almost everything in, in Naples is handwritten. handwritten there is right. almost no, no uh, printed music. Mm-hmm. You know, so there, was, said, there was so many cast, castrati in, in uh, Naples um, that ended up, I mean, the, the castration did not always work out the way that they hoped for. I um, know. And, uh, many, many discouraged castrati ended up in cop- copy shops. Mm-hmm. So they just copied the music. So there were so many copyists in Naples that they never had any market for printing. I see, I see. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, with castrati, the story is so unfortunate. People would, you know, want to end up successful singers, opera singers, and after this operation, <laughs> they would... Uh, their voice would disappear and they would be just regular regular yeah. men and yeah. luckily they had musical some some musical training as you say yeah. they could employ themselves themselves as, as copyists yeah. uh, yes uh, so you had to um, transcribe the music yourself right from the autograph and, that's correct um, um, is is the handwriting of uh, sala uh, legible Clear. Yeah, it is. Uh, it is a little bit different in the different sources, but uh, this uh, this edition is based on all available sources, and there are three autographs and another five uh, other manuscripts uh, with uh, Sala pieces, and they are all handwritten. So I have used, I have chosen one principal source for each and every partimento, and then. The things that I have uh, changed from the principal source, I uh, I uh, give account of that in my critical apparatus. Uh, was it always um, um, easy process? What was the most challenging thing for you during this research? Yeah. The most difficult thing is that uh, I think I made... Uh, four complete versions of the transcriptions because every time when I was almost ready and for publication, uh, then there, there uh, turned up a new source. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I could start from the very beginning because it changes a little bit. Aha, this piece is, uh, now I, I understand this and that and I have to change this. And also the title changed because from the beginning it was 174 partimenti of Nicola Sapal and now we have 189. So that was the most challenging thing. So I, I actually worked with this for seven years mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh, I made four complete versions. So I hope not to find any new sources again. <laughs> uh, but we cannot really predict the future, right? You go into the library, into the oh, archives in yeah. the world, in Europe, perhaps, yeah. or even in, in America, you can find something uh, very unexpected, right? Yeah, we need to know. But now it is, at least it's printed now, so I can't do anything anymore. <laughs> good, good. So, uh, so uh, what's next for you as a researcher, uh, uh, Peter? Do you have... Well, uh, Right now, I'm actually working on German repertoire. So my, my current research project, which I am uh, conducting from the University of Leuven in Belgium, is a three-year, three-year project which will, uh, where I will uh, uh, focus upon the links between Italy and Germany, and especially the, 
the early introduction introduction of General Bas Fugen uh, in um, in uh, in cities like Dresden, Halle, Leipzig uh, before 1710. So it is very early introduction of. Uh, and I have uh, found a few new sources that I will uh, present in my future research. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So, um, uh, German, German sources now. German yeah, yeah. Is, is next for you on yeah. the horizon. That's Great. Right. Uh, how many languages do you speak then? Uh, probably a lot, right? Well, a few. I'm, my, my native language is, uh, is Dutch. Dutch. But I've been living in Sweden for uh, 25 years, so I'm, I'm fluent in Swedish and uh, I, I write most, most of my academic work in English. English? And of course, Italian. You should know Italian because you're... Yeah, yeah. and of course, German. You, you need to learn German for... There's a lot of literature in, in German, so that are my main languages. Wonderful. So... Uh, Thank you so much, Peter, for your so generous time and ideas about the Departmental Works of Nicola Sala. And I hope the, people will get uh, uh, curious about uh, this volume you have produced. Can you tell us a link where they can find you and your work online? Yeah, it is uh, perhaps easiest if, uh, if you just Google my name. My, my name is Vantour with a V in the, in the beginning. And my homepage is uh, www.vantur.se for Sweden. So mm -hmm. www.vantur.se. And then uh, you, you will find my books and my articles and uh, also the Partimento databases are, are you can find there. So... That is maybe the easiest way to find everything. Vantur.se. Great. I will put this everything into the description of, uh, of this conversation and people <laughs> can click and visit uh, your website and check out all your research material, compositions, articles, and, of course, 189 Pertimenti of Nicola Sala, which is available from 15th of April. Wonderful. And we're eagerly uh, await uh, for volume two and three, too. Thank you. Because it's only volume one available right now, right? No, it's, uh, all, uh, all volumes will be avail available from the 15th of, of April. Good. So entire uh, School of Partimenti by Nicola Sala yes as found and uh, researched by Peter Vantour. Great. And you are the first who came up with this critical edition. Not only you provide examples themselves, not only you provide probably facsimiles, right? It's handwriting and sources, but you also um, explain, right? What, what each uh, exercise means, what can be learned from each uh, figure and uh, variation. This is yeah, extremely because in, in, in a, um, let's say, Langlotz manuscript, which I used before, uh, yes, there is introduction, scholarly introduction, and it's very valuable. Yeah. But then you are on your own uh, to learn from facsimiles, which, which, is not, uh, which is not the easiest way for a student, self-taught student, let's say. No, no. And uh, you are like a virtual teacher together with them. You provide exercise and you provide help. Yeah. Right. It's like so the, good, it's like, the good thing with this material is that it is progressive. So it starts very easy with very simple uh, partimenti of only 10 bars or 12 bars, and they increase in difficulty. So at the end of this uh, series, they get extremely complicated, but it starts very simple. Uh huh. Um, wonderful. So it's a it's it's a breakthrough, I think, in partimento research in the world, and uh, amazing addition to the research uh, for general general bus and thorough base in general and continue playing alongside alongside as Grosse general bus by Matheson, for example. This, of course, Grosse general bus is a is a one source and one addition, and you have collected uh, those exercises from let's say four or five sources. Um, yeah. different right 
Yeah. Actually, I, I could also mention another uh, interesting publication which has uh, arrived only a few months ago by uh, a Polish uh, researcher, um, and that is the, uh, a manuscript which is called the Gronau Manuscript. The Gronau Manuscript is one of the very few sources uh, in which, uh, which was a, a student book for fugal improvisation. And it is preserved in the University Library of Gdansk. And uh, um, um, it is uh, published in a, in a beautiful edition um, by Andrzej Sadejko, uh, uh -huh. who is a, an organist in, uh, in, the, in Gdansk. So yeah. these two books, uh, the Sala edition and uh, Andrzej um, uh, fugal edition. These two books will, will I think, um, mean a lot for historical improvisation of uh, of the fugue for for organists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen the Grono uh, publication at least online, and yeah. uh, your your treatise will be wonderful addition to the global research that is is being carried out by by musicologists and organists. Uh, uh, in various countries, right? It's, it's like a cultural collaboration now. Yeah, I think so, yeah. So, wonderful, Peter. Again, good luck in your further research. Let me know what comes up next because I love to to uh, talk about you with this uh, in, in these podcasts. Uh, and uh, uh, let's hope that people will learn a lot from from uh, from the Spartimenti exercises by Nicola Sala, and they will visit your page at vantur.se. Thank you so much, Vidas. If you liked this conversation, I encourage you to visit my blog, Secrets of Organ Playing, at organduo.lt, where you will find lots of insights, practical advice, and training for every area of organ playing. You can subscribe to this blog for free to get your daily dose of inspiration and to be the first to know when any of my future podcasts roll out. I hope to help you reach your dreams in organ playing. I'm Vida Spinkavichus. Thanks for listening and I'll catch you online really soon.